Hey class, uh, SPC 209, how you doing? This is gonna be not a regular lecture. This is gonna kind of be a supplemental lecture. Uh, there's something I really wanted to spend some time talking to you about, guys about. This is not covered under, we're gonna go back to chapter three for a minute uh, and talk about language and how language is used. Um, uh, a question came up from one of your fellow students and I really, really appreciate the fact that she asked me this question because it, uh, made me go back and look at my lecture again and really sort of think about it. And there was something in there that I really glossed over in a matter of a couple of seconds that I think we really need to do a deep dive into. It's talk about, this isn't going to last an hour, but I want to really sort of get into it and talk about it to really to fully demonstrate exactly what the point I was trying to make there during that part of the, the, the lecture. There's a part in the lecture that comes in. Okay, I need to adjust the camera for a second because it's about to fall off the table I've got it resting on. Okay, so at about the three minute, uh, 33 minutes and 30 second point to about 34 and a half, that one minute in there, I talk about language used as a means of control. Okay, uh, and I mentioned uh, how the, 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 the Nazis referred to Jews uh, in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, uh, how uh, a lot of American politicians have re uh, referred to immigrants over the last uh, uh, many years. Uh, and then I briefly mentioned the Tuskegee experiment. And, uh, but, and I said, well, you should know about that. And I, I, I need to remember that, you know, a, a person of my age would know about some things as common knowledge that maybe is not widely disseminated. So for the next couple of minutes, we're going to talk about the Tuskegee experiment. Hopefully you guys already know about it. It, it should be known by everyone in this country. Uh, it is a massively important event that I think we all need to know about because this is not one of those good things that we need to know about. You know about how the settlers came over and the pilgrims. This is a dark event in American history that I think everybody needs to know about so that we can all learn from it. Okay. Tuskegee experiment started in 1932 and was originally called the Tuskegee study on untreated syphilis in the Negro male. Right. I want you to absorb that for a minute. It was called the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male, right? People thought that was fine. People were okay with it. Now, let's jump back to 1932 for a minute. Syphilis did not have an active treatment at that time. It was an uncurable disease. They experimented with a lot of things, <coughs> some of which I am not gonna discuss but they did things like inject small amounts of arsenic, uh, other toxic chemicals into your system. Most people that did know that they had syphilis didn't get it treated because the treatments were so horrible. So in 1932, it was learned that 35% of the population of Macon County, Alabama, which if you know anything about Alabama, <coughs> Macon County is in central eastern Alabama. It's in the Black Belt. It's an agricultural region. The population is very heavily African-American. Uh, it is the home of Tuskegee Institute. It is right next to Lee County, which is the home of Auburn University. Uh, it, is, it is a rural area where the population in 1932 was largely illiterate African-Americans. Okay? In 1932, the Public Health Service learned that 35% of the population of Macon County, Alabama, was positive for syphilis, the highest rate in the United States. So the Public Health Service, an arm of the federal government, wanted to do a study on uh, what was called a study in nature. A study in nature on the progress of syphilis in adult males, okay? Very key thing that they called it a study and not an experiment, okay? The premise of this entire study was basically racist, and there's no two ways around it. You can't argue it. That it was basically that blacks were not able to control their sexual desires and that they're getting infected with venereal disease was part of the natural course of human events for them, okay? In fact, one study cited in the initial application said mental, moral, and physical deterioration of the black population uh, uh, was so bad that virtually free of disease as slaves, 
they are now overwhelmed by it. Okay? But, even though it was basically racist in its premise, they still had human experimentation guidelines back in the 1930s. And this study meant none of them. This experiment meant none of them. So, the people who originated the idea for it decided to call it a study. Now, let's talk about the difference between a study and an experiment. If I want to study the way students at Aiken Technical College react to a fire alarm, I go outside, I stand and watch, and I wait for a fire alarm. That's a study. I don't, I try not to have any impact on the environment that I am watching. Okay, I let things run their course and I simply write down what I see. An experiment, I would go out and pull the fire alarm to see what happened next. Okay? So the framers of the Tuskegee experiment said that it was a study. And as soon as we accept the fact that it's a study, human experimentation guidelines no longer apply. And the United States Public Health Service, an arm of the federal government, signed off. So in 1932, flyers were posted in Macon County for a treatment for bad blood. It's key that the people who are the subjects of this experiment, the, 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 the African-American males living in Macon County, Alabama, were never told that they were, being, they were part of an experiment to track the growth of syphilis. They were told it was a study for the treatment of bad blood. Many of the men in Macon County thought that what they were doing with these medical exams was just prepping people to be pulled into the Civilian Conservation Corps or the military involuntarily, so they didn't want to participate. So in order to improve the number of men that were participating, to increase those numbers, the people who were doing the experiment began to do meaningless examinations of women and children, just to make the men more comfortable and bring them in. Men were offered treatments for their bad blood to bring them in. They were offered free physical exams that were only used by the study for the progress of a disease they weren't told they had. They were offered me free meals on the days they came in for the exams. And for a poor population in rural Alabama in 1930, that was a very big deal. And notably, they were offered burial benefits for when they died. Okay? 600 men were tested. 399 tested positive for syphilis. None of them were informed they had a deadly disease. 201 were also enlisted as a uh, control group, but none of the people involved in the experiment were told they, had, they were involved in any sort of syphilis experiments, and some weren't, some weren't positive for the disease. When, when participation began to drop off, black nurses were hired and brought into Macon County to give a black face to this experiment. So that the thought were being that African Americans in Macon County would be more amiable to being examined by a black nurse and having blood drawn by a black nurse in order to maintain participation in the study. Okay, very, very quickly, the idea that this was just a study and not an experiment began to fall apart. In 1934, Macon County doctors were given a list of the people participating in the study and were told by the United States Public Health Service not to inform them that they had syphilis and not to treat the syphilis if they found it. In 1940, the same note, in 1940, the same request was made to the State of Alabama Public Health Service. Told these are the people that are participating in this story, do not treat them for syphilis. In 1943, penicillin was proven to be an effective, quick, and inexpensive treatment for syphilis, and none of the people in the study were involved were offered that uh, uh, treatment. In 1947, the Public Health Service began offering free penicillin treatments for all venereal diseases that could be treated with it, and none of them, or the participants in the Tuskegee experiment, were informed that that was open to them. All they had to do was ask. Okay. 
This study that was begun in 1932 was not ended for 40 years. It went on until 1972. Meetings were held throughout the 60s discussing the experiment, and every time the end result of those meetings would be to extend the experiment further. Peter Buxton was a public health service social worker in San Francisco, California. San Francisco, California became aware of the experiment. Became incredibly frustrated when he tried to find out what the nature of the experiment was, why they were doing it. Okay? In 1966 and 1968, he filed official protest over the human experimentation, this violating public health service human experimentation guidelines. Both times they were, those uh, uh, protests were turned down. In 1968, the response he got was, a committee of professionals from outside the National Communicable Disease Center has assembled to consider treating the remaining persons in the study group. And after an examination of the data and a very lengthy discussion regarding treatment, our committee of highly competent professionals did not agree nor recommend that this study be ended. Okay, that's 1968. 1972, Peter Buxton took several documents concerning the Tuskegee experiment and took them to the New York Times. The New York Times published an expose on the Tuskegee experiment and it was almost immediately shut down. Eventually, some money would be paid out to the relatives and to the survivors, okay? But the results were pretty uh, uh, what you would expect. 128 of the patients involved in the study died unnecessarily for syphilis. 40 wives of the participants were uh, uh, contracted syphilis. 19 children of the subjects of the experiment contracted congenital syphilis. After the release of the study, African-American male participation in that U.S. health system dropped precipitously, and many feel that that has been a direct cause of African-American male life expectancy dropping by 1.5 years since the study was released in 1972. And now, today, African-American males are some of the uh, uh, lowest uptake levels for the COVID-19 vaccination. And when asked, inevitably, the surveys come back with the same thing, a lack of trust in the healthcare system that they will protect African-American men and the Tuskegee experiment is almost inevitably always brought up. Okay? So the question is, how the hell did they get away with it? I mean, there were human experimentation guidelines that this violated in 1932. Reports were made. This is the federal government. You don't get funded for something in the federal government without having to report back on what happened. So how did they get away with it? How did they keep the people involved? It's simple. They use language to control the environment. Okay? It's simply the way everybody talked about it that allowed them to control the environment that prevented anyone from getting uh, uh, trying to stop it until Peter Buxton attended, stopped it in 1972. First of all, we've already discussed it was a study, not an experiment. By calling it a study, even though it was really meant every definition of an experiment, by calling it a study, it did not meet the requirements for rigorous oversight like an experiment would. By that simple change of a word, if it had originally been called the Tuskegee experiment on untreated syphilis in the Negro male, it would have had to have been looked at as a human experiment and would have never been approved. But by calling it a study, they got away with it. Second of all,
Now, I have no idea if the people who ran this experiment intentionally went to an area where the, the population even in the 1930s was mostly illiterate, but that's who they had. So the people who ran the experiment uh, managed the information that was given to the subjects. Okay. The subjects were never told that the title of the study was the Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in Negro Men. That, that's a violation of any number of things uh, now. Okay? They were never told that the treatments, they, were, they, they, they had syphilis and not bad, bad blood. They were never told the treatments they were getting were completely bogus and were not affecting their conditions in any way. Okay? They were never informed of the nature of their experiment, so they, made, they could not make any informed consent. And after 1947, they were never told that if they simply asked, they would be given a treatment that would cure the disease that they were being studied for. And then finally, let's call this formal language. Formal language used by the experiment managers. Before the mid-1940s, and I had a, a good friend of mine in graduate school. I went to graduate school at Auburn University, literally 12 miles down the road from Tuskegee. And one of my friends in graduate school in 1987 was one of the very first people that were going through all the documentation that the Tuskegee experiment had put out. And what he found was before the 1940s, the subjects of the experiment were inevitably referred to as Negroes. They were never referred to as anything other than that. After the 19, mid 19, late 1940s, when that term would be, uh, uh, became less palatable, they began to refer to the subjects of the experiments as subjects, or even worse, participants, seeming to imply that they knew what they were doing and had volunteered for the study. much like a lab rat is a participant in a study. These men had never been given the opportunity to participate freely and openly. What he also found was the total absence of words in referring to them such as men or people or patients. They were totally absent in any terminology in referring to the subjects that would humanize them in any way. So through the use of language and the manipulation of communication, the managers of this experiment were able to keep it uh, alive for 40 years. And it probably would have continued had Peter Buxton not risked his job and jail to take it to, the, uh, to leak information to the New York Times. 20 years after this, President Clinton formally apologizes to the participants. There's an out-of-court settlement for several million dollars. But one thing I am going to add to sort of wrap all this up, why did Peter Buxton see something that no one else had been able to see in 40 years? Okay. Peter Buxton was a first-generation American. His parents, up to 1939, had lived in Czechoslovakia. His parents... His father was a Czech Jew. And in 1939, when the Germans looked like they were going to invade and take over China, uh, uh, most of Europe, Peter Buxton's family fled Europe to avoid the Nazis. And Peter Buxton grew up with hearing stories of how his family had been the target of communication intended to dehumanize them. And maybe that had an impact on his view of the reports from the Tuskegee experiment. Okay, again, uh, where are we at? 20 minutes, okay? I wanted to get that out to you guys. I wanted you, because one of the things that we, we stress here in, in, in the speech department 
uh, which is basically me, is critical analysis and viewing things critically. Okay? Well, I want you to look at things critically, and I think this is a great case study on how language is manipulated or used in order to persecute or experiment with other humans. And everyone does. Also, no one went to jail for this. No one lost their jobs. Okay? Because there were too many people involved in it that never said anything. Okay? So again, uh, I, I won't name her in, in, in this class uh, because that would be inappropriate, but she knows who she is. She sent me that email asking about the Tuskegee experiment, wanting to know more details. I thank her for sending me that email, giving me this chance to talk to you guys in detail about this specific aspect of, of U.S. history and how language was used uh, to manipulate the system in order to, uh, uh, to do some really, really, uh, what we know in hindsight was horrible things. Okay, if you have any questions about this, I'm also going to attach a great article to this. There'll be another link from McGill University in Quebec, Canada, who did a great article on why this happened. Uh, uh, read that as well. If you have any other questions, please shoot me an email. We'd love to talk to you guys about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, don't forget, I also teach government here, American government here. So, okay, that's it. Everybody stay safe. Uh, send me an email if you need to talk, and we'll talk to you soon.